churches there are. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I think our directions were coming from the north, so that's what happened. But I'll find you easier next time. Uh, uh, when I saw John and two John standing outside, of the oh, the deacons have never lost a minister yet. Yeah. <laughs> Some white people got a little bit <laughs> And uh, so they said they said to my wife, Well what what do we do for the rest of us? Well, let's see, there's Thanksgiving, no, it's the fourth of July, there's Veterans Day, and there's all these different things. But that was a lot of fun getting it started. Starting something new like that is great. And I it just dawned on me on the way here this morning that uh, this is Inglewood, right? The home of the great western form. Yes. Yeah. As they now call it the forum, yes. I think it is. I was so glad that that place was uh, kept. You yeah. know, the, oh, the thought of tearing yeah. that down was right. just, uh, you know, I mean, that is one of the most magnificent buildings you'd ever see. As a matter of fact, there's so much space around there. I went there for a couple of hockey games, because you might remember I'm from Canada, so therefore, I, it was a Canadian businessman who built the forum, Jack Ken oh. Cook. There's supposed to be about a million Canadians in Los Angeles area. That's why they can support two hockey teams. <laughs> None of which is doing very well. But, you know, they, we won the Stanley Cup. That was Glenn Weber and I were cheering them on for that. But I've been there for a couple of games, and I was so glad that they kept the form. I always thought if the UFOs ever land, if they're flying over Los Angeles, they're like, that's a mothership. <laughs> singing. Those two girls over there, when they were singing here, man, it was just really, they were getting all the rest of you guys going. Uh, yes. It was really sing. So, ask the Burmy about, this is my first uh, retirement service, but last week I had my last official oh, service okay. in Glendora, so you guys are the first on the list. Oh, yeah. 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 I have to go on tour now. Oh, so yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. let me, so he's He's, he's taking his first service in Glendora today. I'd rather be here, actually, than be him right now. <laughs> his first service in Glendora. Next week, they're having, they're having a big uh, combine. Mr. DeCox is coming in. So it's, and then the churches amalgamate on the 11th of December. Oh. December 11th, uh, what we call New Covenant, which is our church, amalgamates yeah. with Bernie's New Life Church yes. to form one new church. Which is in the process of being named, probably GCI Glendora. That's things we're kicking around about it. So he wants to keep, uh, you know, the group together. Wants to keep us. In. We'll probably be here until the spring and early summer anyway. Mm -hmm. So he's got this great analogy: when you pass the baton to the next runner, you know, the, the old runner is still running for a while. Oh, so I'm here today, and I'm running. Okay. So, okay. I can easily get you guys worked up. I guess. Oh, <laughs> Do. 
<laughs> and so in other words, you know, if you don't like the results, we're going to blame it on the evangelicals. So <laughs> some people think it is. So while America is still a, religi a very religious country, the big trend in American religion, according to the last census, is the rise of the nuns, not the Catholic N-U-N-S, but the nuns, N-O-N-E. That is, those who have no religious affiliation. They are not the majority by any means, but about one in five or six on the census said, no, we would, we would have no religious affiliation, which is not the same as, that doesn't mean they don't believe in God, but they sort of lost faith in the church. It's the church that uh, is the sticking block for a lot of people in the country. As a matter of fact, there's a book that uh, I had to get for my new career preaching around. They like Jesus, but not the church. It's an interesting feature of the new generation. I'm sure Bernie's talked about this because he's really up on a lot of the trends. Insights from the next generation. They like Jesus, but not the church. What really upsets them about the church is the fact that Christians, the Christian church, the big C church, I call it, in church history class, is claiming to be the revelation from God. They're right. Most other people are not right. And that really offends people. We'll talk about God until the cows come home. You go to Starbucks, you know, that's my office. I used to go to my office. And, uh, you know, you'll hear people talk about God. When you get into the church, it's a bit of a different subject. That's why today I thought when I talk about one of my one of my Jesus trilogy sermons, I call it. The first one I gave in the sermon in, up in Eagle Rock a couple of months ago was if Jesus was not God, then he deserved an Academy Award. Because he sure came pretty close to doing all of the things in his life that God was supposed to. But another aspect of this is why did Jesus talk so much about himself? People who talk about, oh, the church is always claiming to be right and they're wrong. But they've never really considered the words of Christ himself. When you stop to think about it, John Stott, who's a great religious teacher from England, one of my heroes as far as writing and explaining the gospel, he says in his book, Basic Christianity, which some of you probably have read, the most striking feature of the teaching of Jesus is that he was constantly talking about himself. <laughs> and when you stop to think about it, right, you know, this is just another way, a trick way the pastor has to, to get Jesus across here. When you stop to think about it, he's supposed to be the meekest man, but he even bragged about being meek, remember? Okay. Yes. Follow me, because I am meek and lowly of heart. Yes. And you begin to realize nobody could get away with the statements that Jesus Christ made. Moses didn't say... I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mohammed didn't say that. You know? The Buddha didn't even talk about God so much as just being ethical. Not even Dr. Phil has made such a <laughs> Or Oprah. Our teachers of the modern day. Jesus said on a couple of occasions things that actually, actually turned off people who were following him when he said, before Abraham was... Oh, yes. I am. Yeah. And it doesn't seem to square with right. the character of, I think a lot of the young people have got a little bit of a distorted picture and not seeing Jesus coming from the whole Old Testament tradition. Yeah. But he was very conscious of the fact that he was fulfilling so many of the things. So just imagine, I've got a slide here of the temple, a reconstruction of what the temple area looked like in the first century. Man, it was a duty. You know, we talked about the Great Western Forum, right? And this temple was one of the wonders of the world. It's called the Eighth Wonder of the Ancient World. It's Herod's temple, the temple that he added to. You remember Solomon's temple was the first temple. That got smashed and the Jews were taken to Babylon. They came back, rebuilt another temple. And it was so small at the time. Remember the old, old people with wept because they compared it with Solomon's. Well, Herod wanted to be in good with the Jews and for good favor with the Jewish leadership. So he thought, well, I'll, I'll build them a temple. And they built this magnificent structure. This is looking east towards the Mount of Olives. And you can see the bridges going up there. And you can see the people beginning to flock up to worship. And actually, this reconstruction is pretty accurate because in 1970, my wife and I were part of the diggers. We were digging, we were digging 
down about there. And uh, the next year, 71, our ambassador diggers discovered the steps going up to the temple. They called all the steps going back to home of the front. And this big, beautiful Greek building here is called uh, Solomon's Porch. Upper left in the book of Acts, Solomon's Porch, right along the uh, southern wall. When the Romans destroyed the temple, and they just took all of this and dumped it over. We were digging sort of in the dust of the last, you know, 1900 years, but it was a terrific experience. I found my life on an archaeological Now Imagine the young man, not, not, not an impressive looking young man from Portland, Newark, with an accent, standing up somewhere in the midst of that crowd saying, I am the way. I am the truth. Right. I am the life. Yes. Imagine him saying, if any man comes to me, out of his innermost self will flow rivers of living water. These are what scholars call the truth claims of Christ. What does he mean? What is he saying? But that really blew them away when he was talking, I think it was in the book of Matthew chapter 12. I know I got one of these. We don't have that in Windsor where they follow you on the scriptures. It's always fun to, to do that. Matthew chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, he's arguing with them about the Sabbath. They said, look, the Sabbath is full of exceptions. When you have exceptions, you don't have an absolute rule. But the Sabbath is full of exceptions. The priests, he says, in the temple, in verse 5, remember they criticized him for eating the corn on the feeding his disciples on the Sabbath. Yeah. Have you not read in the law on the Sabbath? The priests profane the Sabbath and are blameless. But I say to you, Remember Moses used to say, there will be a prophet who will be coming, and he will be the last word, he'll be the final word. And Jesus didn't say, like all the rabbis would say, as Rabbi Hillel said, or as Moses said. Remember the movie, Fiddler on the Roof? <laughs> Fiddler on the Roof, which every Christian should go see to help you understand the Old Testament, where he says, as Moses said, you know, he's always playing, as it says, by Joshua, you know. And they said, the rabbi's son corrects him, you know, well, I suppose this said, I'm slow of speech. And he keeps quoting, and he attributes everything to Moses, and, and the rabbi's son keeps correcting him, and Timothy finally says, for a man slow of speech, you said an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> but in verse 6 of Matthew 12, said, this, is, this is a corker, isn't it? I tell you yes. that one greater than the <coughs> temple is here. That whole worship system, that whole system. Another place he said, you know, the Ninevites, they, they repented at the preaching of Jonah, but one greater than Jonah is here. That is quite a statement. So I wrote an article for the Canadians five years ago called, Why Did Jesus Talk So Much About Himself? Because it was John Stott, the great English mentor teacher of mine, who put me onto that. And it makes a great subject, doesn't it? That he claims to be greater than the whole temple system. Now, I've got another slide or two to deal with the temple system. That great shot of the temple really gives you an idea of how great the temple was. But I think the next slide is, uh, yeah, there's the temple. There are the Levites. Offering. Jesus claims that uh, all of this is going on in the temple, and he claims that this one young man who walks into the scene here in Jerusalem, that he's more important than all of this. He's yeah. greater than this. Later on, Paul explains that what this was all about. It was pointing to the one greater than the temple. I like this slide. This was taken from our old magazines years ago. I like the kind of beat they have there. It looks better than what you get at Albertson. <laughs> 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 it's a nice hunk of beat. <laughs> someone sent me a Facebook message about, about the, the beat they had for Thanksgiving, and someone else said, if you're going to eat that at Thanksgiving, you might as well go up and bite a cow. Put a look pretty raw. Yeah. Now, yeah. now this is going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. They're roasting the sacrifice. They're taking it outside, dumping the ashes outside. The city. And they're all dressed up. The next picture shows you the high priest. What a shot. I know God spent a lot of time. Just, he spent 50 chapters describing the whole temple system. The high priest's garments, you could give sermons on what the high priest's garments mean. How this breastplate bearing the names of the children of Israel, showing God kept Israel close to his heart. 
you get the ephod, and the white linen that symbolizes righteousness, and the blue garment that covers it. Blue symbolizes the grace of God, like the sky. His mercy is higher than the sky. But we can talk about that in the Palestine. Oh, yes. But these high priesthood, by the time of Jesus, were corrupt. They were corrupt, and they were vicious, and they were out for their position. And when Jesus kept making these great statements, and when he said before Abraham, are you greater than our father Abraham? Before Abraham was, I am. Well, they just not offended. They picked up stones, and they finally did execute Jesus. And of course, the next slide shows the pinnacle of the temple, where not only Jesus was taken by the devil and offered all the kingdoms of the world. This is our artist drawing of it. But James, his brother, was apparently thrown from the pinnacle of the temple in 62 A.D. Many Jews felt that's why God allowed the temple to be destroyed, because James was such a righteous man. He was called camel knees. His knees were as hard as camels from praying. And yet this whole colossal temple tabernacle system, as great as it was, was not what God was really working towards. One greater than the temple is here. One who stood up in the temple courts with all of the scenery and the blowing of the trumpets, Saying, and I, and I think, I think in some ways, it would have been very hard for me, being a skeptic, it would have been very hard for me to see this young guy from Nazareth, who's only 33 years old, and he stands in the midst of all of this crowd, and he's saying, out, if you believe on me, and, I, and it might have even been a small corner of the temple, it was still fulfilling what Jesus was supposed to do. Knowing me, I might have had a hard time with it too, which proves it's only by the grace of God. We see who Jesus is. That's Only by God's grace we begin to get a glimpse of who he is. In John chapter 6, I think this is absolutely striking. We, as Christians, we get used to it, and that's good. We get used to the Bible. That's a good thing to get used to. But in some ways, these, these statements sort of blow your mind when you back off and begin to look at them again, and it shows you the kind of opposition up against. In John 6, 54, usually every communion service, we will read this, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Muhammad did not say that when I'm talking to people of the Islamic religion. Nobody made the claims Jesus Christ made. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the life. This sets Jesus completely apart yes. from all religious teachers. The Buddha, as I said, and all the other people. Even the great rabbis, that they had great teachers. And of course, Muhammad and Buddha, and the rabbis, they all had things, <clears throat> they all had things that were valuable. They all had things to say. But they said, there's the truth over there. If you follow me, you might find the truth. Yeah. Jesus said, I am the okay. truth. I am the truth about life, the truth about eternal life. And this, this verse here really gets into some of his most powerful stuff. John is full of this, as we'll see here in a minute. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is... That kind of thing. NIV's got a real good translation to that, by the way. That's the best translation. My flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Taking Jesus into us is what he's getting at. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I am him. Remains in me. This is a much better translation. I, I'm using the New King James for a very good scholarly reason. The print is big. As I get older, I like to have to be print. Young Catholic boys who are being trained to be confirmed at the age of 12, they get more out of these passages than even their parents and their priests because they say, do you realize what he's saying if we're eating... The canoe were eating the body of Christ and drinking, and some of them have a hard time before, before being confirmed and taking communion. And the priest has to say it's symbolic. Yes, it is symbolic, but in some ways it's more than symbolic. <coughs> that action of the communion service where taking Jesus into himself. Verse 57 says, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will because of me. These are wonderful passages.
passages and they're so basic to Christianity. And it's hard to get into this at Starbucks. <laughs> it's really hard to get in. This is the heavyweight meat of the word, the Gospel of John. There's no more spiritual book in the Bible than the Gospel of John. And we get into these deep waters and that, like I said, 70 disciples when they heard Jesus make these statements. And I don't think he was a big, impressive John Wayne type, you know. He didn't stand out like that. And so why should we follow him and why should we believe him? Well, this is what we said. Moses never made such claims, never. Muhammad never made such claims. The Buddha never made such claims. Even the learned rabbis whom Jesus studied, Hillel, Hillel the wise, he was called. He lived about 100 years before Jesus, and, and they asked him, Rabbi Hillel, can you, can you explain the whole law while standing on one foot? say, how did he prove it? Well, the proof is ongoing. I'm going to just sort of now get back into what I was going to talk about. Remember the old joke about the politician who said, before I speak, I'd like to say something? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I've already said something, so now I'm going to speak, okay? So we're going to, I'm going to take you on a whistle-top tour, stop tour, through the seven I am's in the book of John. You know these, and it's probably been a while, but think of it in the context of Jesus asserting who he is, and you ask yourself why he talked so much about himself, why he had to put himself forward like that. It doesn't seem like the characteristic of a, a meek and righteous holy man. You know, after all, we think of holy men as some of the big robes, you know, going around with Jesus standing up and declaring in the temple, he is the light of the world. This is the second one. How did he prove it? Well, he gave seven statements that we call the seven I am's in the book of John. Most of them you know, so it's good review. And it's always good to see something new about something old. That was John Halpern's definition of writing. It's something new about something old. And the first of the seven I am's, you remember them? The first one was, I am the bread of life. And I am the light of the world. I am the duel. I am the good shepherd. Well, that's a nice one. It's right, protectively in the middle. He says to Martha and Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. That's at the death of Lazarus when Jesus shows up. And everybody is distraught. And I always think, and I, I really shock a bunch of people. We do a lot of funerals in Glendora, in our little church too. A lot of people come who used to be part of our church. And I remember in John 11, during Dave Dixon's funeral, a lot of our ex-members there said, you know, when 
when Jesus said, your brother will live again, Martha answered the way the worldwide church of God used to answer. You know, it's really interesting to see that. She said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Wasn't that our, that was our teaching to a team. We were sort of in the Martha school for that. What did Jesus then say next? You might say, well, that's pretty good. The resurrection, that's pretty good. The last day, I don't mind that. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live again. Wow, what a statement. Of course, it was the resurrection of Lazarus that finally finished him off. You know, the high priests for all their great regalia. They really, they really had something on their hands. They didn't know what to do with uh, Bethany was only about three miles from outside Jerusalem. So this was this was the existential call, you might say, of Jesus' death. So he says also, I am the way, the truth, and the life which I conquered. And he says, I am the vine. And you're part of the vine. And that's why you're still here. Last time I talked in Los Angeles it was about 20 years ago. I don't know where it was, but we were closer to the ocean. That's all I know. Is there a West Chester? Yeah. But here you are. You must be part of the vine. And when I conclude how some of my friends and family have no longer, are no longer with us, I have to conclude, well, we really weren't as attached to the vine as we needed to be. Because if you were, you know, you couldn't get away. But anyway, that's another subject. Let's go back. Look at them, okay? We're using them now. There will be a test, by the way. <laughs> okay. The first one. I am the bread of life. And everything in John is so simple. And the teaching Jesus uses is so simple. Wine, bread, gates, sheep, yeah. you know, breath, breath of life, water. Uh, the teaching of John is, is, is deep enough, it says, for an elephant to drown in it. And yet, shallow enough for an ant to skip across. You can take it both ways. I am the bread of life. And boy, you ever notice that when you're fasting, this, I know it's going to make you feel guilty of Thanksgiving time. <laughs> I have a great excuse about not fasting, because in the winter it's too cold. <laughs> in the summer it's too hot. Oh, okay. you know, it's an easy one to talk yourself out of. When you're fasting, listen with me, the thing, you know, water you can do all right. You can go without water for, for quite a while. But bread seems to be that. <laughs> you just need that, I hate to use the word gluten, but whatever it is. The latest thing now is attacking gluten. All right, I can understand it. But, uh, someone asked the doctor, what is gluten? Well, it's that stuff that sticks everything together. You know? So it's hard to have bread without it. But, but bread of life, and when you're on, not fasting, a load of butter onto the bread. Well, does that ever feel good? That's what gives us substance. That's, now, of course, in Jesus' day, it was barley bread. It was tough stuff. It really could keep you going. Barley bread was what the common people Eight. And of course there was a drink that went along with it, out of barley, <laughs> which we all know. <laughs> and made it beer. We've got pictures in of our statues or drawings of ancient world of people sucking on, on on beer, you know, from, from big barley containers there. But bread of life. Now the thing about bread is we take it in every day. We take it in every day. And Jesus is saying, I want you to take me in every day. He who eats me will live, will feed on me. And it reminds me of a story of a friend of mine in Toronto called, uh, I've got to be careful, i change his name, because I don't want to say too much about it, but hopefully I brought that. His name was Andreas. He was born in Hungary, and he came over, had been abused by his grandparents, came over to Toronto in the 60s, I think it was, but anyway, he was telling me, last time I saw him at the airport, he was sitting down reading his Bible one day, and his son came scooting down the steps and said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, I'm reading the Bible. And his son said, but you've already done it once. <laughs> just like that. Just because we have one piece of bread doesn't mean that's going to be sufficient. Anyway, Andreas had quite a life with such a rough start. By the time he was 16, he'd stolen 100 cars. A hundred cars. He was really in trouble with the law. He had 75 counts against him. 
of waiting to go to court with all of this stuff. And he begins to talk about the fact that he's got to face charges. Then he begins to hear, he'd been hearing the World of More broadcast over the years. This was back in the 80s. And one of our ministers showed up to visit him. And one day he was realizing, you know, maybe I should just try this God stuff. And so, he said, and so he was a person of extremes, right? So everything would be extreme. So he told his lawyer, well, I'm going to depend on God. So your services are no longer required. And he went into the court, and the judge, you know, lined him up and said, okay, uh, who's, by the way, who is your representative? Oh, I, I, I don't have a representative. And the judge says, well, who is your lawyer? And he, at least he was smart enough not to say God, because that would get him, you know. Somehow he got out of it with just a, a one-year sentence. A hundred cars, 75 counts wow. against them. And he told me the story of how the judge looked at the jury's verdict. And the judge looked at it, looked out the window, read it again, looked at it, read it again. He said, I don't know why I'm doing this. But I'm going to change this sentence to a year and a day. And that's how Andreas began to finally realized that God had really bailed him out. He was with him. He was a day-to-day -day savior Amen. for day-to-day -day problems. Yes. And he went back to his jail cell and all the way said, oh, I wish I had a Bible. He went back to his bed and there on the bed was a Bible. No. And he opened up, opened the Luke 15, the prodigal son. Okay. Oh, so he, knew, right. he knew God was with him. Yes. And he had this little ministry going on in prison where the guy next to him said, what happened? I heard about you. You got off. You've only got a year. And he said, well, you know, I, I really, finally, I think I'm getting right with God. And the other prisoner said, do you think this would work for me? <laughs> he said, well, let's pray about it. Let me pray about it. And the other guy got his, kicked out his lawyer as well. He, he got a minor sentence. So Andreas was showing that it is no secret what God can do. That was the name of the article that I've written. It is no secret that what God can do. There was a, a cowboy singer in the late 40s in Los Angeles. Here's the Los Angeles story. And he was feeling miserable. Actually, you know, he was the worst kind. His father had been a preacher. I mean, that, you've got to really prove you're bad when your father's a preacher, it seems. So as it turned out, he was just miserably. I think I don't want to get the two men mixed up. They were both in L.A. But anyway, he ended up on a radio station singing cowboy and might have mixed him up with the other. As it turned out, he changed his life. He went to the Billy Graham Crusade in 1949. <coughs> Billy Graham had a big crusade in Los Angeles that really got his ministry launched. This man went to it and turned his life around. He went to a reception in Hollywood <coughs> and he ran into his old friend John Wayne. Everybody's heard of John Wayne. Okay. So this guy ends up so they drinking tomato juice or whatever it was, and by the typical Hollywood party. And he says, hey, I, John Wayne says, hey, Calvin, I hear you got religion. And he said, yeah, and, and it's really work, and it's really taken, John, you know. And John Wayne said, well, how do you explain that? He says, well, you know, John, it is no secret what God can do. And John Wayne said, that sounds like a song. And the guy wrote the song. When I was seven years old, my mother had me sing it in church. It was no secret what God can do. So I wrote up the story of Andreas and his, he had a lot of battles, he had a lot of problems and addictions to overcome after, but when he told me that story about him reading the Bible and his son coming down, but you already did it once. He's feeding on the word of God. He's feeding on the Christ who comes through. You know, and of course we can't leave the Holy Spirit out of this because Jesus is in one place at the right hand of the Father, as we know. Yes. But the Spirit, through the Spirit, Jesus is able to be everywhere. When we read that Bible, we prove to ourselves, we know that He is alive. He's who we said He was. He's the bread of life. He gives us the sustenance every day. We go to our prayer closet. We go in there burdened and worried. It doesn't take very long, maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes. You come out and you're ready to face the world. Yes, because the bread of life we've been feeding on, that interaction. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world, Jesus said. That was spoken at the Feast of Tabernacles when Jerusalem was all lit up with torches. The temple area, 
especially it was very bright, very brightly lit with torches, you could see. And then this young man stands up and says, I am the light of the world in John chapter 8 and verse 12. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. And when I go to the drugstore, there he is, I'm a better boy. Have you been hiding there since I've been talking? Give this man a break, huh? <laughs> I am the light of the world. You know, when I go to a drugstore, quite often when I go to a drugstore, there are ladies usually outside with a little table set up. And they're usually dealing with, they come from an abused relationship, and they're going to this uh, house or this uh, care home that looks after them. And I always, you know, they're always looking to me for money, and sometimes I will give it to them. But most often I will say, who are you with? I'm a pastor. Who are you with? And they say, oh, we're with David Wilkerson. Oh, yeah, David Wilkerson. Ever see the movie The Cross and the Switch Play? Pat Boone stars in this movie back in the early 60s. David Wilkerson, a young man from Indiana in the 19, late 50s, decides he's got a calling from God to go and help people in Harlem, out in the middle of New York City. And he ends up, you know, there's a funny scene where he ends up being chased by people and he's got one shoe and He's Pat Boone walking along the street. And the police think he's a rowdy and they want to arrest him, you know. No, no, I've come here to, I'm the light of the world. <laughs> he said, well, right now you couldn't light out and light up the bathroom. Who are you? <laughs> so anyway, he finally gets a little group together. And the story is told in, in evidence that demands a verdict about how David Wilkerson ends up talking to the toughest gangs, the Malmouths in New York. This is late in the early 60s. And one of them, the tough gang leader was Nicky Cruz. Nicky Cruz, who stands up when Wilkerson gets carried away, sees a big crowd of people coming just to make fun, to mock him. Two different gangs. They buried the hatchet enough to come in here and head. You know. Wilkerson was saying, Jesus is in this room right now. He has come, and he's come just for you. If you want your life changed, now is the time. And he said, okay, are you ready? Stand up, those who receive Christ. And Nicky Cruz, you know, the guy next to him, Israel, he said, stood up and says, I'm going forward, who's with me? And they all get carried away up to the front. And you know, the way the Protestants do this is pretty simple. And they accept Jesus Christ. And Nicky Cruz has spent every weekend of his life after crisscrossing the U.S. sharing his faith in Jesus Christ. He has spoken to over 200,000 young people. That's the power of the gospel. That's Jesus, the light of the world. The next thing he told us was, I am the gate. I am the way. They say that the shepherds, when they built their sheepfolds in ancient times, that they left a little space, the gate, like our aisle here today. And they say that the shepherd would actually lie down in front of the gate. He would actually lie down with his staff, and that's where he would sleep at night because uh, they didn't want any sheep to stray, and they didn't want any wild animals to be coming in. Jesus, the gate, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the way to the Father. No man comes to the Father except through me. This is a very hard statement for people today. You know, you wouldn't almost want to, you'd, you'd never want to use it at a public rally or a public crusade. You can only say some of this stuff in church, <laughs> right? The people who have accepted Christ, who've made the statement, you know, who have who had the living bread experience every day of their life. I know the way, Jesus said. And some of you might know Bill and Barbara Edwards from the Aurora Church, Pasadena Church. Many of you remember Bill. He died several years ago. And we have these testimonies here from David Wilkerson, from Andreas, so they're showing that Jesus is still alive, that he's still changing lives. He's who he said he was. And Bill Edwards, the way he died, just lit up everybody who talked to him and who knew him. And we had a service once, and he was really not feeling well. But I remember getting up the priest said, is that Bill Edwards in the back? And he was dealing with cancer, a very serious kind. He only had about two months to live after that. And he was in the back and said, is that Mr. Bill Edwards back here? Yes, it is. And so we had a lady who was, who was quite she was wobbly in her faith, and she was talking at the luncheon after her. Great things happen at church luncheons, by the way. You know, Pastor Bernie 
is a great believer in eating your way to salvation. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you had the big picnic up there in August. Uh, he said, uh, Glenn Weber and I had to give the message. And so we said, well, what do you want us to speak about? Eating. And of course, if you think about it, Jesus is eating quite often in the Gospels. He sits at meat in the Pharisee's house. Matthew was converted and he makes him a banquet. And what's the guy up in the tree? Uh, Zacchaeus. In the sycamore tree makes him a great big bank. So Jesus is even eating with the Pharisees. Sometimes. It's a way to bridge things. Anyway, we're all around the lunch table. I never heard about it, but one of my members, one of my elders, heard about it. And the lady comes up, I'm, I've heard about what you're going through. I am so sorry for you. And Bill says, don't be. I know where I'm going. I'm all right with this. Isn't that something? What, what a testimony to be able to, to face that because Jesus is the way. He has access. You know, it's a great passage. Paul uses the word access quite often. That the blood of Christ gives us access to the highest, to the holy of holies in the heavenly places. I know where I'm going because Jesus came from the bosom of the Father in John chapter 1. That's a phrase. I've got to preach on that one of these days. But the only begotten Son who's in the bosom of the Father. Now that, you know, we can't quite explain the Trinity as clearly as we like, but when you're a bosom buddy, right, you know, you're pretty close. You're about as close as you can be, and yet you're separate. You know, you're, you're distinct, but you're not quite separate. You're all of one mind. So Jesus came from the bosom of the Father to meet us, interact with us, and take us back to him. And that's another sermon about him. Ephesians 2, 8, how he says, Paul says, he has taken us already to the heavenly places. We sit already in the heavenly places in Christ. I wonder if you said that. Ephesians 2, verse 8. People hardly believe me when I tell them this. He has taken us to the heavenly places. I might get it there. You should look it up. Ephesians 2, 8. We kept the Glendora Church going for years. <laughs> One of our best scriptures. Number four is the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Everyone who came before me was a thief and a liar. And I think now we begin to see why Jesus has to declare himself so much. You know? uh, okay, the Ephesians 2, 8, yeah. 2, 9. Try. Or is it 3, 8? Oh, well, don't, don't depend on me. I'm only a mortal man. Jesus is the good shepherd. 
the good shepherd who does good things. He goes ahead of us in our lives. And Bernie and I talked about planning the merger of our two churches. And we wanted to go see the Quaker church that we rent from, a beautiful Quaker building. And we wanted to ask them if, you know, they would consider letting us move our services back to 1 o'clock on Sunday. Because they're in there at 10.30, so could we uh, move our church? You know, because Bernie was meeting at 2.30, and in my church, older church people, that's that's a problem because of you know, daylight savings time in the winter. We've got a lot of people who end up, you know, not able to drive home in the dark. So he said, what if we could move it back to 1 o'clock? So we went and had lunch with the Quakers, and we were saying, and so then, first of all, the pastor says, now, is there anything we can do to make this change easier? And I boarded up before, well, could you change our services back to one o'clock? <laughs> and they said, you know, we've been talking amongst ourselves, and we thought, we better move these services back to one o'clock. Yeah. See, there you go. The shepherd goes ahead of the sheep. Okay. Yes. The shepherd goes ahead of the sheep. Yes. He has to build these little bridges over yes. the streams. Yes. He has to check out where the best place is to rest. There's a great book everyone should read called The Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by a man named Keller. He was a shepherd in B.C. and Montana. And it's all about Psalm 23 and how the shepherd is always on the job. He's, he's got to go up to the high country. That's the dangerous path because there's animals in the way and everything. And so the, the good shepherd goes ahead. He scouts it up. You're going to rest here. Okay, I can get them. And the next day we'll get them to here. We better pull some, put some rocks over the stream because of sheep. It doesn't take anything to scatter sheep. You know, flowing water will scatter sheep. That's why it says he leads me besides the still waters. You know, it's, it's not a rushing so He doesn't lead me beside Niagara Falls. <laughs> it's not happening. But the good shepherd goes ahead of us. And over and over again in this transition we've been making, I've been seeing God go ahead of us. Next week is the last service for the old Glendora Church. We'd already planned for Mr. DeCotts to come there in the summer. This is going to be a very opportunity. And so these things keep happening. And you see them in your own life as well. One of the great I am's, of course, is I am the resurrection and the life. And the older you get, and the more funerals you do at a funeral in October, we'll have a funeral coming up in November in our congregation. A uh, man not in the church, but his mother was. This promise becomes very special. The resurrection and the life. Zoe in the Greek. Zoe. You have the name Zoe, that's another Greek name from the New Testament. I am the resurrection and the life. Life is a big word in the book of John. If you go through the book of John, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The life of the world to come. Have you ever considered in that context, and I got to know this scripture from giving so many funerals, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13. This is the one that seems to really get people's attention. Oh, that's one we can put up there because it's a, sh a shot. By the way, how am I doing for time? Yeah, I think I can smell the food coming. So that's always a good sign. It's time to wrap. Pretty close. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Wow, who said that? Socrates? Moses, Moses didn't come close to saying anything like that. So you see the founders of all the religions, Muhammad, no, of course not. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. You know the Spirit talks. The Spirit preaches. The Spirit declares things. That's one of the great scriptures on the Holy Spirit. One of the 40 scriptures that show the Holy Spirit is a living presence. Get me back and I'll cover that too. <laughs> yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. Heaven is the rest of the same. Heaven is where the souls go, the spirits go to rest. But they come back with Jesus at the resurrection because the body and the spirit will be joined together at the resurrection. It doesn't invalidate the resurrection at all. Jesus, it says in 1 Thessalonians, when I gave that sermon at Forest Lawn 15 years ago, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and Jesus will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Remember that? Yes. I remember giving a 
that funeral sermon, I drove back home today thinking, what did I just read? But good old John Calvin, back in the 1500s, had figured out that heaven is where our spirits go to rest, but they have to be reunited with the body at the resurrection. God does not give up on the body. What I wanted to pay attention to was the first part of that verse. Blessed are the dead. Have you ever read a book that said, blessed are the dead? Have you ever heard a religious preacher say, blessed are the dead? <laughs> Where in the world would you go to hear a strange statement like that? That you're better off if you die in the Lord. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. What a, what a capstone to Jesus' declaration that he was the resurrection and the life. Remember that one. It's a great one. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Christians, like I said, some of this you can't preach in the world. What I do when I have a funeral... I've got 200 people, captive audience, locked in. No. The undertaker's not going to let them out. <laughs> At least once I let them see some of these passages. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From now on, from now on, since Jesus was raised, he's now taking people with him to the heavenly places, which is another verse to get going about. Number six is, we've already covered, when Jesus talks about, I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life. I am the way to the Father because I came from the bosom of the Father. I am the truth about existence. I am the truth about what life is all about. And I am the life of the world to come. You might say there's a three in one, right? John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Isn't he something? You can't help but feel a bit closer when you're, when you're preaching his words like that. What a great privilege. Uh, ministers and preachers have a great privilege. You know, Dean Blackwell used to say, imagine getting paid for something like that. <laughs> <laughs> imagine getting paid for quoting Revelation 14. You know, that's, that's John 14, 6. The way, the truth, and the life nobody ever came. No sane person ever spoke like Jesus spoke, Scott said. Now there's Charles Manson, right? <laughs> okay, you know, and there's Jim Jones, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are crazy people, yeah. but no sane person. Well, I didn't, uh, did I tell you about the Lord, why the lunatic, right? You know, C.S. Lewis's, that's the worst of I'm giving all of my sermons here in one day. <laughs> I got nothing left. <laughs> and then in the seventh I am, as I am the vine, you are the vine. Stay with the vine. You know, there's a life and a vitality in this church. There really is. Because you're here. You might say you're the... Remember Curtis May? Remember what the model of the Los Angeles church was when Curtis May was here? Well, maybe we won't remember it differently. Curtis and I came and preached a couple of times. Like the model of the church was we're here for the duration. Remember that? You don't? Okay, that's good. I can't even remember my sermon. <laughs> So, Curtis used to say, we're here for the duration. And you guys, you're here for the duration. You've stuck it out. You've, you've proven your loyalty. You have proven your loyalty. So any, any branch that bears fruit is purged. The branch that doesn't bear fruit is cast away. Although I don't believe that people who left us are necessarily all lost. God's got big plans for us all in the future. But we hang together. <laughs> We stay together. And that's why it's good to come in and see your good order and your good spirit. And everybody's happy and you found the pastor and you didn't get lost. That's good to see. <laughs> if Jesus was God, we would expect him to say things like we've just been covering. After all, I think one of the reasons he has to be like this, and we can even make up all of our own reasons, why he... Why he always talked about himself was he had to separate himself from all the other teachers that were out there, from all the false teachers. And he's still doing that. If we were God, Jesus said, if you did not give me the glory, the rocks would cry out, right? Yeah. That was one of his statements. All who came before me were thieves. I am the way. I am the gate. I am the door. Well, I'm going to end off now reading a, a, a little... Uh, recitation that actually Martin Luther King used a couple of times. And I'll end off with this. It's called The Incomparable Crest. That won't be in your computer, so it's a little bit 
The incomparable Christ. And you'll like this. So sit back, put your pens and Bibles down. And this is, someone wrote this about 100 years ago. It really summarizes Jesus' his ministry, what we've been talking about. Uh, maybe you can get it because it is on the internet. <laughs> More than 1,900 years ago, there was a man born contrary to the laws of life. The virgin birth. Coming up quickly at Christmas. This man lived in poverty and was reared in obscurity. He did not travel widely. Only once did he cross the boundary of the country in which he lived during exile and childhood taken into Egypt. His life's work was confined to a little place much less smaller than Tasmania. He possessed neither wealth nor influence. His relatives were inconspicuous, and he had not much formal training or education. But in infancy, he startled the king. In childhood, he puzzled doctors. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature, walked upon the billows as if pavements, and calmed the sea to sleep. He healed the multitude without medicine. He made no charge for his services. Master, Master, heal me! They cried out. The two people who knew Jesus were, uh, was, were the demons and the desperate. <laughs> it seemed like the blind and the ill, all these, Master, Son of David, heal me! You know, sometimes remember the disciples would say, quiet and down, you know. But he would, uh, he would always come to it. He healed the multitude, made no charge. He never wrote a book. And yet all the libraries of the country couldn't hold the books that had been written about him. He never practiced medicine. And yet he's healed more broken hearts than all the doctors far and near. He never marshaled an army or drafted a soldier nor fired a gun. And yet no leader ever had more volunteers following his orders. Making more rebels stack their arms and surrender. All without one shot being fired. Mickey Cruz. From the Malmounts. The names of the past proud statesmen of Greece and Rome have come and gone. The names of the past scientists, philosophers, and theologians have come and gone again. The name of this man abounds still. Every calendar is testimony to his life. Our years are counted from his birth, A.D. And though time has spread 1900 years between the people of his time, and the scene of his crucifixion, he still lives. Herod could not kill him. The demons could not scare him. Death could not destroy him. And the grave could not hold him. He is the incomparable Christ. Can you give me an amen?